and ask you whether there's anything you'd like me to say in introducing Clark. Right. Terrible introducing me actually. I gave this talk on Monday and the lady introduced me by reading basically telling them my first three slides. <laughs> so Vince, um, Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about some work. I I did that thing where at the beginning of the week I said, right, what did I put in my abstract again? <laughs> I'm not too far off that. So um, So that's that's a good thing. Um, I was just mentioning her, this is Imogen, um, she's a final year project student who's doing this work, oh well, with the second half of the work where we've actually analysed the performance of students a bit, um, it's done mainly by, by her, she's, she's doing a final year project with me, um, she's a very talented third year, and she's going to be a teacher next year, she's going to be an excellent teacher, um, so that's her Twitter handle, because I'm encouraging her to get onto Twitter and to speak to people on there, because there's so much to learn. Um, I, I, I started putting this quote up at the beginning of a lot of talks, a lot of pedagogic talks I give. It was uh, Sue Rigby from Edinburgh at, um, at a conference last year said this, we can choose how we teach, we have to teach in a way that is fun. And I, I think that's, that's, that's good to remind ourselves sometimes that, that you know, in the classroom we, we do get to choose what we do to some effect. And so so I, I, I certainly try and make it, if not fun for my students, at least fun for me, because that's, that's you know, I spend a lot of my time doing it. So <laughs> and if I can make it fun for my students, that's obviously good as well. So, um, I'm going to be talking about a particular class that I teach, and I teach our first years how to code, and uh, this all came after a discussion uh, we had at Cardiff about what a mathematician was, um, and so that's something I put together quite a long time ago, actually, and so I believe I, I'm Neo, uh, I don't have any friends anymore, somehow I've managed to find someone to marry me. Uh, but yeah, and so we kind of discussed this and we realized, well actually a modern day mathematician must know how to code. And whereas before at Cardiff there was a bit of code thrown in here and there, um, the school made a decision that no, we're going to have a first year module that is kind of computer science 101, um, you know, how, how, to, how to code. And this is one little example that I like to put up. Does anyone know off the top of their heads what that would do? You can see. <laughs> yeah, you see it as well. Yeah. So that that to some extent does that. So there's a couple of lines of code, drop points randomly on a, on a tile and count the number of points that are in the inscribed circle and, and do their best to estimate pi. And so that's yeah, kind of neat. But obviously we can use mathematics in in uh, some of the work I do, um, which is fairly applied, um, but also you, you need code in uh, very pure aspects of mathematics. And so students have often heard of the proof of the four color theorem when they arrive, and um, uh, these kind of things. So modern mathematician must, must search code. Now, I'm gonna, I normally show this at the end of my talks, but I'm gonna show this. This is a student who did the course last year, and like a lot of students that year, turned up and all of a sudden we're told that they have to learn how to code, and, well, didn't really want to. <laughs> um, and this was a, a two or three minute talk he gave at an open source software conference the same same year, so I don't know how well we can hear it. Okay, um, thank you, like I said, my name is Matt, uh, and I'm here to talk about why I think uh, computing should have a bigger role in education. I'm a mathematics student here at Cardiff, and for the first time this year, computing was a compulsory module for all of the uh, undergraduate students. Being honest, when I first heard that I would be studying maths, I was a bit hesitant. Uh, I couldn't see what it had to do with some numbers. <laughs> uh, so, we started with learning Python. Uh, we covered everything from printing words to begin with, to writing searching algorithms, uh, to even object oriented programming towards the end. And we did all this in a few weeks, so it was pretty intense. We then moved straight on to uh, learning, uh, sorry, to using what we had learned uh, in Sage, which uh, Vince talked about earlier. This was especially useful for me as a mathematician. Um, and from there, I was able to immediately start using those skills that I had developed in my other modules. And these are skills that are gonna help me into the next four years of my degree. The coursework that we had to complete for our computing module um, was to create a report about something to do with maths, and it had to involve computing. 
So I chose to talk about prime number theory. Um, I used the skills that I had learned in computing uh, to create functions to check if a number was prime, um, and even to plot simple graphs in Sage to explain their distribution. Um, my knowledge of computing helped me to explain a theory that mathematicians, professional mathematicians, have been trying to work out for hundreds of years. And it even helped give me an insight into what prime numbers have got to do with the Riemann hypothesis. This is something you guys may have heard of. There's a one million pound prize for someone who can submit a solution to it. It's arguably one of the most famous problems in mathematics. And I wouldn't have got that understanding of that problem if not for computing. In the space of just three months of teaching, I went from having not the first clue about what computing or coding was, and have ended up with skills that will help me for the next four years while I'm studying at university. Yesterday and today, I've met and spoken with some amazing people, and I'm looking forward to learning more about computing. This is the impact that computing has had on me, and what I'm really trying to say is, why did I have to wait until university to learn this? Thank you. So he kind of came out of the blue and said that, and I was like just really emotional at the time. So it still, still raises, uh, raises goosebumps. But anyway, um, that's kind of the why of and what it was that I was teaching. And now I'm going to talk a bit more about how uh, and the pedagogic approach that I'm using. So I use what's called a flipped class. And the, the, the basic idea behind a flipped class is that before contact time is when students are going to have initial exposure to content. They start constructing their understanding of the material and the concepts, and, and I, the one I think is most important is they identify uh, difficulties uh, and, and things that, that they don't understand. And then during contact time, you have further content, um, or this you try and reduce as much as possible, and then you, you help uh, finish the construction of the understanding, and you address difficulties, and those two ones kind of go in, in tow. And that's, that's the theory behind it. Um, can you see that? Does that come up okay on the, on the screen? Okay. Uh, so this is the class uh, in, in its simplicity. And um, you see there are two semesters. And I'm going to just talk about this semester for now. I'll, I'll talk about the spring semester uh, later. Um, and the idea is that they have in red some contact time with me. And in blue they have these lab sessions where they are assimilating contact um, Themselves. And the whole idea about a flipped class, and the whole thing that's important in flipped class, is the feedback vector of, um, most importantly, me finding out what it is they, they can't do, and what it is they're having difficulty with. And so they're getting that feedback within the lab sessions, but then also, I then speak to whoever's in the lab sessions and find out, ah, oh, okay, this week they're really having trouble with if statements, um, or, or something similar. And then in class, we talk about it. And so what that means in practice is that they have two days at the beginning of the week, Monday and Tuesday, where they have labs. And then on Thursday, they have the class with me, which means in practice that on Wednesday in the evening, I'm usually up late planning to be able to reactively teach. So that, that, is, that is more workload uh, because I can't just use the same thing forever. I'm constantly reactively uh, teaching. Um, and hopefully they're... <laughs> uh, the, the flipped aspect is all done with these these lab sheets, it's it's all online, and they they know that on a particular week they're doing a particular lab sheet, and there are video hints. So in essence, I've already lectured once, but I've just uh, recorded it, and so they can they can go through and and look at various things. On the uh, on the lab sheets, you'll see some of these questions are called tickables, and that actually um, is an idea that Bath University had, and um, and I've been using. And so the way the class works is that they have to get a certain number of ticks to not lose a global percentage of their performance on the module. Um, and so that's the incentive. Now, to get a tick, it's a binary yes, no. And that's what happens in the lab sessions. It's simply have they attempted it. Um, far from success. It's not at all an indicator of success. It's just an attempt, at, an indicator of having tried it. In fact, if they all succeeded everything, it kind of there's nothing to do. Uh, so so I, I, I'm fairly quick to give a tick uh, when, when students don't, uh, are, haven't succeeded but have tried. So that just means that during the lab sessions you go around and you, and you tick uh, students whether or not they've done something. And often it'll be, why don't you try this for a little bit? And then, and then you 
kind of pop them in the right direction. And this is the point where they don't know anything about what they're doing yet. Um, a lot of students, um, it's nice to see, uh, turn up to the labs having done everything already, and they just come, say, can I just get myself ticked? And they get their ticks, and then some of them leave, and some of them start working on the stuff for the next week. So that, that works pretty, pretty well. Um, this is what a class looks like. Um, I think you saw an older version of this photo uh, last, <laughs> last time. This was this, was this year. Um, I really like that photo. Does anyone want to suggest why? Yeah, that's, that's one of the things, yeah. I'm not in it. Um, I'm, I'm at the back taking the photo because I'm... I'm you don't look much older than that. <laughs> that's very kind of you. Um, I, I'm not sure who, who, if that's a nice thing to me or if that just means it. Uh, but yeah, so, so, and that's the way it works. This, this class doesn't, uh, does not have someone at the front of it. Um, another thing that's nice, and you had no way to tell, is that this young man here is, um, is actually a student from the previous year. Uh, so to run all these labs, the very first year was exhausting uh, <laughs> because we didn't have enough people uh, to do it. Uh, so myself and a, and a postgraduate student uh, spent a lot of time in the labs. But, um, but now I'm using students who did it last year. Um, and, and that's something I'm really excited about because the expertise needed in the lab is not that great because you just need to tick whether or not someone's tried something. Uh, that works quite well, but also for the students themselves, you know, you really see them continuing their learning process, their kind of extensive learning process. So that's that's how the labs work. And then basically I feed back from the, the tutors, I, I find out, oh, they're really having trouble with this, and then that's what we go over in, in the class. And so in the class meeting, I, I as I said, on the Wednesday night, I, pre I prepare what I'm going to say, and either I give another example of something, go over another way to do it, or... And, and that always works quite well um, because after the first couple of weeks, the students realize that it is an opportunity to ask a lot of questions. And often we go down roads that are not at all where I would have taken us otherwise. Uh, and, and what's also interesting, I had this discussion with the student, they're like, oh, but surely your job as an educator is to know what we'll find difficult. Uh, but that's, you know, that's putting everything in a very behavioralist framework where, where, where all students are the same. And, and over, the, over the years, proved to not be true. Um, the first year students had a really hard time with for loops and the second time it, I was ready for that difficulty and it was very simple to them. So um, yeah. This is an indicator of engagement with how, how much they do the work before. Um, most of them you see do everything. Um, there are some that don't but in that batch there's actually some students um, who just stop the course and are too lazy to take them out of my data set. Um, so so yeah, people people do the work and, and it's fine. I, I think the real reason for that is is that there's no alternative. I explained to them that this is what doing the course is. The, the equivalent of another class where going to class meant sitting in the room. My my equivalent of that is doing the work. There's, if they don't do that, they're not in the course in the class. So um, that seems to work. And then obviously having the timetable session for them to do the work really does help. Here's how the students do. I'm putting this up here for completeness, really. Uh, they have three forms of assessment. The, the first form is a class test, and that happens in week six, and it's basically their first piece of university assessment. Um, I always remember one student last year who, after the class test, came to see me and he said, oh, Vince, when will I be able to do the class test again? I think I'll do much better on it the second time. I'm ready for it now. And I said, oh, well, you're at university now. That, that doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Um, so in a way, it's, it is difficult. It's designed to be difficult, but also I think it's a good thing that you know, they have a bit of hard assessment straight from the, the off, it kind of wakes them up. Then they have this individual coursework, which is in red here, and that's the, the, the brief for that is go study some, that's what Matt was talking about in that video, go study something that you find interesting um, and write a two-page report, a three-page report about it. Uh, someone this year wrote about the Futurama theorem, there's a mathematical theorem that was developed for, for the episode of Futur an episode of Futurama. Um, and that was really cool to read. And they go off and they read. They do something interesting, which is which is really nice. And they often do a lot better than in the class test, uh, because I think they realize here's an opportunity to get some marks back after the class test was hard. Um, and then they they have this group coursework where they they all do okay, and that's the whole second term of of the class. Um, some comments that we had on the open feedback 
forms after after these eleven weeks. Uh, a lot of nice things about the website, about the videos, about the tickable system. Um, and Sam even used the word flipped class, which was nice to, to see. Uh, some of the more helpful comments, uh, which are the, the negative ones. This has actually reduced quite a lot from the previous year. It is a lot of the comments were saying, "I just need a bit more help. I need a bit more help." And that's that's something that in when you when you flip things around, um, that students often often say. And then a lot of the students said, "Oh, could the class meeting be used to look forward on stuff? Maybe give us a bit of a preemptive. Next week, you're going to be looking at this for ten minutes." And I don't want to do that. So I had a discussion with the class about it. I, I, I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll see if I'm right or not, but I, I think it's too early to tell whether or not. Um, a lot of students saying having a big test at the beginning of the term was bad. They, they don't realize that it actually helps them out a lot. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So now, now to come back to this structure and to talk about the spring semester. When I first wanted to teach this class, I just wanted to teach these 11 weeks. Um, I've been talking with our director of learning and teaching and saying, well, could we extend this and embed enterprise within it. And I was like, okay, let's see what we can do. Let's, we talked about it, then talked to um, the, well, the Neil who leads the enterprise uh, uh, department at the university, and we came up with quite a nice plan. And as you can see, there's even less red on this side, uh, because everything really is um, uh, self self-generated content, um, where the students kind of do everything. And so the idea is, okay, you've learned some mathematics, you've learned how to put mathematics in the real world using code. Now form a, a company of, of four and um, solve a problem. And so you have to look at aspects with regards to what's the value added of this, who's your market, etc., etc., etc. And um, that that works quite well. It's quite it's quite fun. Uh, they they get these three three sets of uh, assessment slash feedback. They give me a a report three weeks in, which is their project proposal, where I basically find out what it is they're doing, and that allows me to, to say, oh no, you want to look at this, you want to look at that. The Grand Council is uh, a really good bit of fun. I think I've got a photo of that, so I'll talk about that. And then, it's coming up soon now, uh, the group presentations are at the end. So uh, that's that's how this is assessed. You'll see there's a lot of feedback vectors um, throughout. And uh, this is all done with, uh, with the minutes. So students, I tell them, you have to meet Three times, two, two to three times a week, I'd recommend you meet. Uh, and what I want you to do with every every class at, on every Thursday at eleven, I want the secretary of that of that company to hand me in minutes. Um, and this is one example that they look at. I, I normally bring them with me, but I forgot to, and so on, on the train, I said I asked my wife to take a picture of one that was lying on the on the thing. Uh, so I don't expect you to read it too much, but this is kind of what I expect. It's two paragraphs. It can be written as long as it's tidy. I had one last week. Where they'd written it in crayon. And I actually like I actually called them up on it. I said, oh, you know, I'm not asking for much here, but please don't write it in crayon. They their minutes this week was very professional. They said we all discussed the fact we wrote in crayon and agreed that that was not acceptable. So that was very nice. Um, and it's just like, tell me what you're doing, tell me what difficulties you have. I can pick up issues with regards to group work. You know, if someone's not turning up to meetings, I tell them to tell me this and then I can just email the person. But in general, I can just read through and very quickly email one or two company secretaries saying, hey, I heard you guys are looking at this, actually take a look at that. Or hey guys, I think it's worth you coming and speaking to me. And then, and then they do. Um, so that, that works quite well. And as I say, they've got a company secretary and a project manager, and they all have very well-defined uh, responsibilities. For example, the responsibility of the secretary is to make sure I get these minutes every week. And they're the person I communicate to. I don't communicate to the whole group, I communicate to the secretary. And it's, it's done fairly formally, which I think is a good exercise for them. This is the Grand Council. This is the Grand Council from last year. Um, and this year I was able to film them, but I haven't quite managed to get the films uh, all edited, otherwise I could have shown you a few. And basically, out of the 40 groups, um, the project manager of every group gives a one minute pitch about what they're doing. Uh, and, it, and it's a strict one minute. I'm in the corner there with a timer, and when they go over the minute, I, I kick them off because they're taking off the time of the person behind them. Now this isn't assessed formally, uh, but I think it's a nice, fun exercise to do, and also lets all companies know what everyone's kind of doing, so they all get an idea as to what what the standard is. Here's one example. This takes a while to load. I should have opened it. Here's one example of what one of the teams came up with. 
see if that loads. So they built this website. You can, you can go see it right now. The Fight Club Heroku app built a website, and it, it to find out who could who would win between various uh, um, superheroes. So I think Obi Wan would win. Click submit. Keeps going. You can click who are they. You get a little thing like that, and. So, and then the mathematics of how the rankings is, uh, is there. Um, this is, um, this is great. And this is a great example of what I like about this course, because these guys from a coding point of view went and learned a web framework called Django, which at no point would I suggest that all students should learn. Uh, I, no way, absolutely not. But it was the right tool for them to learn. And now there's four students who know how to write a scalable website. Uh, so, so that's great, and there's a lot of examples of things like that. I'd, one group uh, designed something that allowed you to cheat, cheat at poker. They came to see me to find out if it was all right. I was like, just make sure my name's nowhere near it, um, and loads of different things uh, like that. One, uh, one group built a phone app to allow you to use game theory to share a taxi fare in a fair way, which I thought was very, very clever. Um, sadly, that's, that's not carried on, but there's a few ideas that really should have. Um, most of this was done by, with Neil, uh, who's the, the enterprise guy at Cardiff, and he, he was extremely helpful, uh, helping me learn a whole bunch of stuff I didn't know before or undertaking this. <coughs> um, now to, to get to the second half of that, that's kind of the course, how it's taught, what I, what I do, and what the students do. And what we've been doing with Imogen, who is the student I mentioned at the beginning, is evaluating it and evaluating the learning in it. There was a paper in 2004. So 14, pardon me, by uh, Freeman and uh, and a bunch of co-authors that did a meta-study of a bunch of pedagogic research that compared active learning environments to passive learning environments. And a passive learning environment was defined as something where students sit and listen. And an active learning environment was defined as anything from a flipped class to a more method class to something where students had to answer a lot of questions in class. So it was quite, quite vague. And, um, and they were able to conclusively show that the research says that uh, that students have improved performance when they are active, which kind of makes sense again. Um, let me uh, show another little clip of another student who spoke about this class, and he just a couple of first minutes of when when he spoke, kind of show a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, I don't think I have time for that, so I'll. Uh... I'll be there, but I don't know the students need anyone. Um, at which point, I'll pass over to Alex. So, we'll see you later. Great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my name is Alex. I'm in my second year doing the undergraduate class. Um, this is really good to see you. I have to say, I love you. Especially in the second semester, and um, I didn't read it. All my other oh, I've got to go do that now, Okay. Um, I can, so this learning and the way he's teaching it, a lot of the maths is very hands on anyway. You can't get anywhere with their actions because he's doing it. But in a lecture, you will there, you're watching the lecturer, and he's doing the maths too, and then afterwards you have to sort of try and copy what he did. If you think about you know Carpenter and his apprentice, you know, you're watching him and he's sculpting this marvelous ball, and then you have to go and try to dip that and maybe you'll get an OK ball again. But as he goes over there, it's possible to do And so then you have to, you know, you have to figure it out for yourself and make mistakes, and not be terribly wrong, and in the end you'll do the tools. And then once you do the tools, you can do whatever with it. So in the so I both really like and, and really cringe at one of the things he says there. Um, so it's first of all really nice, but the thing to remember is Alex is probably one of the best coders in our school, um, not just incorporating students. <laughs> He's a very, very talented young man. Um, and so it's nice that he, you know, that he says, yeah, it's great that we have to be active. And in mathematics, one has to be an active participant in the learning process. The bit... Um, it always makes me cringe a bit is when he says, oh, there's some tools. But I say, there's some tools, just go away. Which obviously won't work for everybody, right? Um, a lot of students need a lot more scaffolding than that. Uh, so so I, think, uh, I think that's something that I, I, 
I do reflect on, I do my best to scaffold a lot, uh, and, and in particular that's something I still need to reflect on, make sure I get right. But it's as he said, you know, it's, it is an active learning environment. The students have to do stuff. And a lot of time, they don't just have to understand the content themselves, they have to produce the content themselves. Um, Realized I've got an O this morning, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Uh, a capital O. Um, another really great paper that's just come out is by um, Porapat and a bunch of co authors. Also, it should be a capital P, I apologize for that. Um, other rated personality and academic performance, <coughs> evidence and implications. So, what Porapat did is he looked at a meta study of a whole bunch of pedagogic studies that uh, studied the um, relationship between personality and intellectual ability with regards to academic performance. And so there's the five, the big five personality model, which, um, uh, which is used to, to put us in boxes, so to speak. And, and poor Pat was able to, to show that most studies have shown that uh, the biggest predictor of academic achievement is not uh, intellectual ability, but uh, conscientiousness, uh, which is a particular personality factor that I like to loosely translate as ability to work hard or willingness to work hard, but there's, there's a lot more enveloped in, in conscientiousness. The second one is openness. Um, openness is a personality factor that loosely I would say is how much you want to learn, how much open you are to, to seeing new things. Uh, so with Imogen, we decided to look at this uh, and, and try and first of all reproduce this, and second of all, uh, see if there's a particular difference that we see appearing in a traditionally taught class and a flipped class. And I really like this uh, idea that conscientiousness was the most important thing, most important, most significant uh, predictor of academic ability, because um, I know that worked for me. Uh, I This is my little academic story. Um, I was quite good in mathematics at, uh, at primary school. I could add a bunch of numbers quite well. Um, and then I hit high school, uh, which coincided with puberty, <laughs> which coincided with me losing interest. And, um, and I wasn't doing too well. And my mom, my mother was always quite distraught because she was like, oh, but you're smart, you're smart, you're smart. And I'm like, I'm not that smart. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to just be a mediocre student. Um, and I was okay with that. And then I had one physics teacher, Miss um, Terak, and she, uh, she was very mean. Um, but but she, she completely just changed everything about how I see stuff. And I realized, oh, in her class, you have to work hard. And if you work hard, you actually can do quite well. Um, and that's when I thought, oh, I just need to work a little bit, and I'll do enough to get my mom off my back. And then I realized, oh, actually, I really like working hard. And, um, and that's kind of everything that stemmed from, from there, really. So this, this, this paper by Porapat really hit, hit home. So we wanted to reproduce it. And so Imogen uh, worked tirelessly uh, and collected a lot of data. She, uh, she first of all collected data from three surveys we gave to the students um, at three different times over the year. Um, sorry, over the first term. So as they're going through the flipped class, we are like, how do you like learning this way? Okay, how do you like learning this way now? Um, how much do you think you're going to get on your class test? Okay, you've just done your class test. Now estimate how much you've gotten and, and things like that. Um, we also got uh, data for their marks, obviously, in the computing module, so in the flipped class, as well as their marks in other modules um, that are more traditionally taught. And then, finally, Imogen um, ran a bunch of focus groups, so she gets some qualitative <coughs> data, which actually spoke to some students. Again, the problem with that um, is that the students she spoke to was quite self-selecting. Uh, the students that came up and made time, a, a box of donuts was given to them as something, but uh, the students that made time to come speak to Imogen were, were the ones that were enjoying the class. The ones who didn't, they weren't going to spend another hour. So that, that we obviously have to take into account. And then another focus group she ran that I'll come to uh, back to at the very end is um, uh, one with the student tutors, so the students who were students last year and were now tutoring. So it was quite nice to get their perspective on, on things. After using some principal component analysis, we had to kind of split out these five dimensions of the, the personality model. Um, it see, it's, we seem to identify two different types of, of openness. If these are the, the, the five, if you put that one together, um, ones are in the model, conscientiousness is the one I mentioned before, and openness is the one I mentioned before. 
And so the literature uh, quite often brings those in as the biggest predictors of academic uh, success and sometimes extroversion gets in there as well. Out of these two types of openness, we like to think of openness one as openness to really go into depth, whereas openness <coughs> two is perhaps your ability, your, your likeliness to get distracted. Um, so, so openness one is people who really want to go into depth right, in the learning. Here is what our class looks like. So uh, there, are, there are 83 students in this in this data set. So there are 150 on the class. I've also got marks for 150, and we had 83 respond to the personality. Uh, our, our data, because we had all these different data sets, different questionnaires at different times, uh, you know, sometimes when we drill down, one of the data sets only has like 30 people left. <laughs> so so this, is, this is kind of one of the biggest ones. Um, and as you see that our students are kind of around the openness uh, factor. Not a big uh, variation in openness one. Um, and then certain, certain things I didn't expect us to see. I didn't expect mathematicians to have such a range of extroversion, but perhaps I'm just being short-sighted. Um, here is one of the results. So it is a linear model trying to predict the average mark in other modules um, against conscientiousness. We put this through and it, conscientiousness was the one that was that had the biggest effect after a stepwise linear regression. So I'm skipping some steps. And we see that it has a positive um, <coughs> effect at a significant level. Whether or not we're going to talk about p-values now is not the time. But uh, in line with the literature, we kind of have confirmed that, yeah, in a traditional taught class, um, conscientiousness has a positive effect on uh, performance. And there you can see it there. Not, not the best regression. Uh, our points kind of all over the place, but in our small data set, it was it was something. Uh, and again, it, it confirms the literature. So when we put the other variables in, they did not come out as, as having an effect, a statistical effect. So when we actually looked at the computing for mathematics module, so this module that is taught in a flipped class way, openness one, so is is the only thing that came out as significant. Again, contentiousness dropped away. And so that in itself is already very interesting. So for one cohort of students, we're getting in a, a significant difference in what is the most important personality trait in a class to, to develop performance. And so openness one, again, being the how much you want to go deep into a subject in a flipped class where you're kind of putting everything on the student, <coughs> it kind of makes sense that, yeah, if, if they want to work hard, they, they, they'll do well. Um, so, so that was my The Okay. Is what that regression line looks like. Perhaps slightly better than the other one. Um, we decided to look at this measure alpha, which was just the ratio of the performances, because um, my marks are always quite high in, in computing, but I'm perhaps an, an eager marker. Uh, and uh, in, in the other ones, perhaps, are not as eager. So in a way, it doesn't really make sense to compare marks for marks. So if we look at the ratio, and then we started um, clustering either side of the median of that ratio to, to be able to say someone who's above average, so to speak, um, in, in one thing or other. But just as it is, alpha is the ratio of the mark in the flipped class over the mark in a traditional class. And um, there we got some interesting things. Because first of all, we see that openness one makes that go up, uh, which again, kind of is to be expected. and then conscientiousness makes that go down. So if you looked at that half a second, you'd say, all right, in a flipped class, if you're hard working, you're less likely to do well compared to the traditional class. Uh, and we're still trying to get our minds around that one a little bit, but I, I think it's just kind of showing that uh, the gains you can make are perhaps less. Um, and that's just what, what I said uh, there. So, so what? Um, <laughs> the, uh, the importance of scaffolding, I think, if, if the significant indicator of performance in a flipped class is the student's willingness to learn and openness uh, to new things, then how, how do we make sure that we, we scaffold well enough for the students who perhaps aren't that open to new concepts, and specifically something like computing, which is 
not necessarily what everyone came to university to study mathematics and wanted to learn. Um, and so that, that scaffolding is, is very important, ensuring that uh, the lab sheets are well written, ensuring that they can get help, ensuring that any sign of life is, is rewarded by, by some, some sort of scaffolding. Um, and also, if, if the willingness to learn is, is what's going to be the biggest indicator, then how, how do you spark that interest um, in the first place? And, uh, and that's something that I, I continue to work on. But that, there would be my things that I think I would say, well, if you are going to teach in a flipped class, keep, keep these in mind, that, that if you can make it interesting, that the students actually want to learn it, then they will do it in their own time. <coughs> the final thing, and I put a big perhaps here, is that a flipped class approach, an active learning approach, incentivizes deep learning. We often have discussions in our uh, common room um, saying, oh, the students aren't turning up to class, the students aren't engaging, and I'm telling them they need to, otherwise they won't do well. And then the exams turn around, and the students do okay, um, which kind of means they were right, um, if okay was what they wanted, or what they're perhaps satisfied with, that yeah, I don't need to turn up and I do okay, well, stop telling me I need to turn up because I'll, I'll still do okay. Whereas um, it seems, and, and it just goes back to that conscientiousness, they might not be interested, but they might just be able to work hard and do the surface learning they need to do. Whereas here it seems like, again, based on a very small data set and, and a lot of caveats, it seems like this, this pedagogical approach actually incentivizes deep learning. Um, please. Sorry, because I'm sure you said it, but I've got this horrible cold. But which, which assessment maps was it for the... So flips module. that's fair. No, I did not say that. I should have. Sorry. Uh, for the flip module, it was everything. Um, not so the group coursework. Not oh, the group coursework. Right, yeah. yeah. So it was the the class test and the individual coursework, uh, but not the group course. Um, just to talk about the focus groups briefly. I don't know if I've spoken too fast, but I won't keep it much longer. Uh, just to talk about the focus group groups briefly, one of the tutors, he's, he's tutor I, because I, I removed myself from the focus groups. I said to Imogen, no, 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 I don't want to know, I don't want to be there because, <coughs> well, first of all, the students, they're, they're currently doing my modules, so we want them to be able to badmouth me all they want. And second of all, the tutors are kind of working for me, so we want them to be able to badmouth me all they want. So tutor I says, I think it's a module that you get out of it what you put in. So all of us around this table clearly put into it. Pretty sure I know who Tutor I is because he said that to me once or twice, um, or she. Uh, but but again, I think that just points back to this idea that uh, I've built a module that if you put a lot of effort in, you get a lot out, and I think that does reflect in a flipped class, and that's a good thing. That's something I'm happy with. But going back to what Alex said about a carpenter carving a bowl, um, it's something that also I really need to make sure I think about, and I think someone needs to think about in a flipped class, in a class where they're putting the responsibility of the learning on the students, is how to make sure that no one gets left behind. And that I don't yet know that I have the answer to that. I know I'm putting a lot of effort into it, uh, but that's something that's, that's important. Because the only way to get that flipped class to work, I think, is to do it 100%. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of uh, individuals who have tried to flip class, students have turned up, they haven't done the reading, and so they just talked it normally anyway. The students immediately would be silly to do any reading. Um, it, you know, they, they've got no reason to, because it's just they, they can have a passive approach. So the only way to do it is to just be firmly active and, and, and really dive in, and just this is what we're doing. Involve the students in the process, involve the students in the pedagogic approach. I mean, the first time I heard of a flip class, I went, well, yes, if we were going to teach from now, we would probably do something, not necessarily for the class, but like this, the, the lecture method is something that made sense a long time ago. That still makes sense, uh, obviously, in various occasions today. Um, so yeah, this is a large flip class. Often flip class are saying to not work in a large uh, way, and uh, presented some research into the effect of personality, which, as far as I know, hasn't, hasn't been done uh, very much. And the uh, big thing is making sure you don't leave anyone behind you just dive in and throw the responsibility at the student just to make sure that it works for everyone. Um, I mentioned it briefly, so I didn't think I was going to have time to talk about it today, but I didn't talk, so maybe I severely underestimated how long it's going to be. All right, so not okay. <laughs> um, is we've looked at lots of categories. So all, these, all this work that we've done is we've now kind of said, okay, the students whose interest in programming has increased, how, how do the, the 
the conclusions we've come to work when you look at that particular category of students and uh, those kind of things. There's a lot of interesting stuff in the focus groups, a lot of discussions uh, that the students had that I found fascinating to read. And also there's a lot of literature on this that we want to keep on going into. Um, that's everything I have to say. So this talk is more or less online. I, I just noticed there's some problems with it. And otherwise, if you don't like to get in touch with me, please do. But that's something I have to say. Thank you for staying. <laughs> Have a good time. <laughs> Any questions? For me? No. <laughs> yeah, so something to the uh, personalities is, is very interesting. Mm. So um, we do some flip learning too, and you see the model feedback at the end. And some students like it, mm. but some students, it's anonymous, I don't know who it is, but some students don't like it. Right. And that could well be the conscientious students who have performed well in the who are not open to students, who are suddenly going, I thought I knew how to do this. Um, this this way of studying that's worked for me since I was 12, I know, why, why is this not working yeah, anymore, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, actually, when you're little, they do this, right? You, yeah. Kindergarten just keeps this, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Certainly, A-levels and university, it's not in the third year class, all that bad habits of yeah. teaching within the course. And so it, it's tricky, right? Those students are quite right to say, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I've, I've been lied to, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything exactly. I need to do is here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I like that. I don't know how, I think you're just starting to think about how to tackle that, right? But yes, exactly. Scaffolding, I guess. So what do you do for scaffolding? How do you so, I mean, by scaffolding, it's just making sure all the things that are around the students are there. So, um, the way I, I believe, I believe I didn't go over this when you were in the room. No, so I missed the lot. No, right, yeah, yeah. No. I was actually going to look at the furniture we're having in our new flip learning room. Oh, how yeah, cool! So, how cool! Yeah, yeah. How cool! I was explaining over lunch scale. Ah, oh, there's those rooms. Yeah. And it looks like we've got lots of room, so the, the plans are looking good. Oh, great. So, um, so this is how it works. There are these lab sheets that students go through, um, and there are some questions that are tickable, and that's kind of the ones that are incentivized. They kind of have to, have to make sure they look at. Um, and then there are video hints, which are uh, basically me lecturing on, on the topic. Mm -hmm. But uh, something I, these are the same video hints that, that were there the first time the course was run. And talking about reactive uh, education, I, I'm, I'm able to react by, on a Wednesday night, I prep what I'm gonna talk about on a Thursday, uh, based on how they did on the Monday and the Tuesday. And so that's very immediate reactivity. But um, something I plan on doing this summer is, is expanding that. Because whilst there, that's me lecturing on how I think they should deal with variable assignment, um, I now know some of the difficulties they have, and so I need to just build up more of this stuff that they can go get help when they need it. Um, there's a, we have another thing that we've been, we've set up at Cardiff, which is called the Code Club, which is a terrible name because there's an actual thing called Code Club, and I never want to like tweet about it because I'm like, oh, mine's just what we call our little like get together, uh, and that's just where students can come and just play with code, which I think is important for a mathematics uh, school because. You know, they've got lots of support for the mathematics, you know, that's, that's all there, but um, just having a little place where people can go and have fun like that. And then I have regular office hours as well. So just assistance for students who need it is, is kind of what I mean by the scaffolding um, and just putting a lot of resources in front of them and making them aware of those resources as well. I think it's, it's a difficulty I sometimes have where like students say, oh, um, I don't know where this is. And I'm like, oh, it's like... Your, your mouse was right on it, you know? <laughs> um, but I'm not sure how to get it. So this is your pre-activity, right? Yeah, that's all pre-activity. Okay. Yeah. So you expect them to go through that, hit some stuff, and then turn up to the class, and they have something yeah. to do, I missed a lot. Yeah, so they have, um, let me uh, let me bring up the general structure. Um, do, 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 do. Sorry, that's just seeing this so this is the general structure of the class. Um, <coughs> okay. Don't worry about this, this is the second half, this, this group activity. And Big, uh, the big caveat that I have is that I have timetable sessions for them to use labs, and that is where their tickables get checked in a binary way. But to get a tick, they just have to have put effort in. So in fact, I encourage the lab tutors who were second year students in the course last year to give them a tick even if they don't have the right answer. And sometimes the students aren't necessarily happy about that because they're like, oh, no, I want to know what the right answer is. And then that's when they say, oh, well, that's what Vince is going to go over in the class. Um, so the, this is where we fish to find out what it is they're having difficulty with. And then, uh, so they have two of those over two days, and then they have me going over the concepts. So each student goes to two of those? 
then each student goes to however many they want. Okay. They can turn up to the first one, having done all the tickables, and some students do, I'd say about 10% of students do, they turn up to the, to, to the lab session and say, I've got all my ticks, can you check them please? Yep, great, great, oh, could you just read up about that please? Go away, you read it, cool, can you explain? Yeah, great, tick, and the student goes, can I go? And you say, yeah. Um, so it's just a play, a lot of it really is, because I can't make an assumption that everyone has a machine, like a computer, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's that's the idea. And then you have your lecture after, which is the actual yeah, which activities are really Exactly. So all the content gets transferred by then. And then um, let's go back to this idea. This is the most important part for me, I think. Uh, during those sessions is really when we identify the difficulties. And not just us as the educational team, but um, the students identify what they can't do. You know, a lot of the time they're like, the computer's not working. Um, well, no, actually, you, you don't understand that it's really important to use the correct syntax. You can't just write words into the computer, uh, that kind of thing. And then, yes, yeah, so this happens on, on Thursday. Um, and I think there was one class um, this, this past year that lasted 20 minutes as opposed to the normal 50 because there was really nothing to say. And uh, I didn't keep them there. Does it get them to do more reading and more work outside the talk sessions? Outside your lab time, outside the next time, you're doing flipped learning. Yeah. Does it get them to use all that time to do it's, learning? It's difficult to say because I don't know more compared to what. Well, but I just wonder if you try to measure it. Yeah, so getting uh, in discussion with the focus group, which is again a very biased uh, thing, they all say they do a lot more work in this one than in others. But they don't necessarily all seem to be saying it in a negative way. Um, and also, I'd certainly see it because after the first lab session, they realize that if they just turn up to the lab session having done nothing, they've got no chance. So they, they have to, the lab session is, is that is that immediate binary feedback session. It's part of the assessment process. It's not quite part of the assessment process. It's uh, as in, they if they don't do it, they will lose a percentage of the mark. And again, it's not right or wrong, right? It's, it's have you done it. Um, so... I say it's not part of the assessment process. That's because students often go, oh, this doesn't count. And I have to say, well, no, it doesn't count. But if you don't do it, you will lose marks. And that, that goes back to the idea, because I've had another colleague that say, well, why don't you just give them an extra 20% for, for doing all their ticks? Um, and I don't want to do that, because that's, that becomes an extra 20%. And going back to what I said about the norm in my class is participation. And so I don't want to give extra for participating. It's active. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And the tickable, they have to do a proportion. Yeah, it's 80%. Right. 80% of the ticks. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, by... I, I've had, over two years, I've had two students that I haven't taken any away from. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to take any away from anyone, yeah. right? <laughs> that's, not, that's not the point. So. And then, yeah, like, what, what really happens in the second term, though, where I kind of remove myself completely from the loop, then they go off and learn a lot of stuff. Um, and again, not stuff that I would say everyone needs to learn, uh, but stuff that they need to learn, so that's, that's fun. So we have, okay. I was gonna say those resources that you're kind of fronted and preparing these little classes of final variables. Yeah. Could they do that? Yeah, yeah. Um, Some of them in the class get it, right? Oh yeah, 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 very much so. so that kind of peer thing is also, I mean, I don't know how much of it do, but that would be loving to add that to this work. Yeah, yeah. So that hasn't been formalized, okay. um, but that would be a really nice thing to do, actually. Is in, and what some students did in this part, so this part, they, they have to go form a company, address a problem, and, and blah, blah, And a lot, I think there were two companies last year that built a website to help teach coding. Um, so, and one of them was actually finished. <coughs> I really should have captured that more. Um, but like, there's a wiki on the website that they can they can use. They're all explaining stuff to each other on Facebook. Apparently, I'm not on there. I'm not cool enough. Uh, so, so apparently, yeah. Snapchat now is which. Yeah, I like to pretend, I like to pretend I don't know what it is. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so that 
that's there. And then the tutors also help. But yeah, maybe getting students to actually do some of those would be a good idea. To formally do it would be a really nice idea. Yeah, even the websites, they may work. Hey, how do you do that? They put into, that happens, right? Yeah, that happens, and I, I encourage it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time, yeah, exactly yeah, a lot of the time I, I step into a lab uh, to, to just see how the other tutors are doing. You know, they're just second years as well, right? Mm -hmm. So the first, first couple of weeks, I make sure that they are properly scaffolded as well, that they're not just left in the class. Um, and at the beginning, there's everyone's very quiet and stuff, and, I, and I, I kind of make a point, no, no, these have to be loud. These sessions have to be loud. Um, if you've explained something to one person, and then they get it, and then someone else has the same problem, just tell them to go speak to them. And that's, that's what's happening there. Um, and also there, 